the first and third verse. Blue sky. everybody here to our services here at the Valley View Church of Christ. I look out and I see a few visitors and also our faithful members that make it back each and every week and we are glad that each and every one of you made it today. Jumping into our announcements, I first want to kick it off to our youth group. You are invited to a youth rally today. It's going to be out at CRC. Do not worry about transportation because it is provided for you. All you need to do is be up here at the building by 3 p.m. because we have a bus that's going to be taking you out and bringing you back. So again, youth rally today for our youth out at CRC. Kindergarten through 12th grade, this is for moms and son night. There is a sign up sheet on the hallway on the bulletin board. Now that mom and son night is gonna begin at 545 here at the building. It's gonna be this Friday night. So again, this Friday night, 545, mom and son night, sign up sheet on the bulletin board in the hallway. If you have a women's bicycle, it is needed for the Blessed to Bless ministry. So again, if you have a lady's bicycle and you can spare it, please see Mitzi Manning, and that will go to the Blessed to Bless ministry. Last thing we have is a card I'll read. It says, our deepest expression of appreciation is extended to Valley View Church of Christ family for the many ways in which you have shown your support, your love, and sympathy to our family during Jim's long struggle with his health and your concern in his last days with his earthly family. The funeral service will be treasured in our hearts always, and the meal provided to, for the family brought our extended family together to strengthen and renew our love for each other. The Valley View Church of Christ family certainly reflects the love that binds as God would have us. And thank you from the Jim Brown family. Now that's all I have. If we don't have anything else, I will hand it off to Grant. out with me. Dear God, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this morning. Lord, I ask that you find glory and honor in our worship. Lord, be with Spencer as he presents his lesson this morning. Allow us to take something from it and apply it to our daily walk. Dear God, thank you so much for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross, and it's his name we pray. Amen. Shout out for joy to the Lord. All of the earth worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. 
Thanksgiving. With Thanksgiving. And his corpse. With praise. Give, give thanks to him. And praise his name. For his love. For his love endures forever. Good morning, everyone. Uh, if you didn't know that professional team, uh, that's my favorite two members of the youth group. Sorry for those that uh, aren't in that. Uh, that was a birthday present to my father-in-law uh, a few years ago. Um, let's stand together this morning as we sing. Um, if you couldn't understand, uh, that was Psalm 100. Um, and even on a, on a beautiful morning like this, when the pollen is all within us, and it's hard to sing and hard to talk and, and hard to get out of bed, we can still shout for joy to the Lord together. Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is good. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give him thanks and praise his name. Why is that? For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Amen.
open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. Be seated, please. First Corinthians chapter 11, 23 through 32. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. 
Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. As Christians, this is the most uh, poignant moment of our worship. So we come together and we remember the sacrifice on the cross by a pure, undeserving Savior. And while we know we can never be perfect, what degree do we strive for that perfection? Do we continue to sin just so that grace may abound? Or do we make a constant effort to please the Lord? In this passage, Paul is speaking to a group of people with no discipline, no desire to work, to live holy, but they still commune with Christ as if everything is okay. As we partake of the Lord's Supper, let us examine ourselves to ensure that our goal is to live righteously so that we honor the sacrifice made for us on the cross. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to worship you. Praise you, Lord. Lord, we ask that we gather around and we commune with you and we ask you to bless this cup or bless this, bless this loaf that represents the broken body of our Savior. Lord, help us partake in a way to be pleasing unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. pray for the cup. Dear Lord, again, we praise you. We thank you for the sacrifice of your son on the cross. We ask you to bless this cup of the fruit of the vine, which represents the bloodshed on our, from our Savior for our sins. We ask you to uh, bless us as we partake away and be pleasing unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. This time we've set a part of part of this worship to give back a portion which God has given to us. There's baskets on the table in the back. There's a QR code on the screen. You can also give at our website. Uh, this money will go to further God's kingdom, not only here in Jonesboro but all over the world. Uh, help support our members here and support those who uh, we reach out to to bring to Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the blessings that you've given us. Lord, we live in a, a blessed area, a place with, with opportunity. Lord, we know that uh, there's others out there who are, aren't as blessed as us who don't know you, Lord. And we ask you to help us to give back the part which you've given to us. Help that money to be used to further your kingdom, to bring others to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thy word is a
This morning's scripture reading comes from Psalms chapter 19, verses 7 through 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is true, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Good morning. That was okay. Good morning. It's a beautiful day. We got to have some volume. We have a lot of visitors. We're grateful you're you're with us today. Um, I know Chandler's brother's here, getting his first exposure to Jonesboro. So we we want to put on our best behavior for him and his family. Several visiting over here in the college section. I have a friend and his wife. Uh, well, she's a friend too. We have two friends visiting. Jeremy and Sonny Folding. He's the preacher at Lake Charles. Brought some Lake Charles folks with him. He was from Iowa before that. That's where we first became uh, friends. And, and then he moved to Lake Charles. And they're here for the CRC lectures. If you get a chance to go to that, uh, get, steal away for a few minutes. I'm Todd speaking and some others from the area that you will know. And, and even if you don't, come out there. There's some good stuff. And, and Jeremy will be nice to you. He'll take you for coffee if you get out there. You tell him you're from Valley View. I'm going to say one thing about him just to see the effect he'll have where he's at. He loves to kill Razorbacks. A couple of amens, but a lot of, ooh. You're deciding whether to let him stay, aren't you? Are we going to take a vote? No. Uh, he is. He, he does go out and kill wild hogs and stuff like that, but it's, it's not a sports thing. It's an actual hunting thing, which 
which may tick off some of you too. I, I don't know. But anyway, uh, that's kind of his thing. He's a, a guy's guy like that. So uh, I have to, I do, we do need to pause. Um, Annette uh, Mayo, who usually sits behind where Alfreda is, or right beside where Alfreda is, she's in the ICU at NEA, and it's just not looking really good. Uh, last night, talking to her, uh, she's just feeling miserable and is ready. And it could happen any time. And I just, I just think we need to pause and pray. So let's pray together. Father, we are grateful that you are our creator. And every day, you give us life for another day. You've given us a gift of another one today. And I pray, Father, that the way that we use it will, will represent and reflect the fact we know who gave it to us and how, how you want us to live it. And I pray, Father, that you'll be with Annette right now, that you'll bless her, that if, if our... If I are in the family desire that she uh, be strengthened and restored to come back to us and be with us longer, we will consider that a great witness for you. If you choose, for whatever reason, um, to call her home now, we would pray that you do that peacefully and graciously, and that she will accept it, her family accept it, will accept it, and know that that, too, is the will of our Creator. And I pray, Father, that we can learn to accept that about everything. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're in Psalm 19, so if you would enjoy, uh, turn to Psalm 19, and I want you to see it in print. It's gonna, some of it's going to be on the screen, but I want you to see it in your own Bibles or on your own phones when we get started here in just a second. Let's sing together. Jesus loves me this Why do we believe that there is a God? You might find that a strange question to ask at church because obviously we believe that. It's what drove you to get ready this morning and to drive up the hill, come up on top of this hill and to, and to be here for the first day of the week where God calls us to meet with him. You believe he exists. And you're like, that's a question for atheists, right? Uh, we don't have any atheists at church, which you never really know though, right? You could have invited somebody who doesn't believe in God at all. They could be present with us. But that's not really the point of why we're talking about it. We need to, every once in a while, reflect and review and rehearse this as a group of people who believe it. And in this psalm, Psalm 19, this is a psalm giving praise to God for the three things that cause us to reflect and realize God really does exist. We just need to review it. This is not apologetic. I'm not trying to argue for the existence of God, and the Bible doesn't either. This is a psalm of praise where we thank God for his evidences and the revelation he's given us that we're not just making this stuff up in our heads, that we are serving a God who really does exist. And every time we gather like this, there are some people who might believe, but they might, they might, have, some, they might have some doubt in their heads, some recurring doubt that keeps coming up, and they need to be reminded. There are some people who are practical atheists, I believe in God, but I haven't really obeyed him. I'm not really living for him. I'm just giving him lip service. And this is not a belief or a doctrine that we just believe intellectually but makes no difference in our lives. It's supposed to make, it's, it's a difference. It's an impact. There's implications. And guys, we should be living out of the joy and the security of this doctrine. That's what Psalm 19 is wanting us to do. Let's review this and let's sing it, David says, all the reasons why we believe it. And the first argument we made last week. Look at the world. That's Psalm 19, 1 through 6. Look at the world. See the order of it. See the existence of it. There's no way this got here by accident. And boy, this week, after we talked about this last Sunday, and then Monday, we're hit with an eclipse. Now, how many watched the eclipse? Raise your hand. How many were watching soap operas? How, was anybody watching a soap opera instead of watching the eclipse? We are going to toss you out right now. Just don't raise your hand. You don't want to do that. Who would have missed that? How many thought, you know, I just thought ho-hum, but it turned out that was amazing. Anybody think? I did too. This is the evidence. This is part of this world God created, and he builds in some surprises. Let me just give you a few little treats. And that's one of them we saw. That's the existence of God, and like clockwork, it comes across our, our, our vision, right? It's telling us there's no accident to this world. It's a God generated. And Paul says this about it. We talked about this last week. Romans chapter 1. All the things, that, just nature itself 
it's clearly seen. It's not like, well, you we got to look between the, you kind of kind of squint off. No, it doesn't take much. Just look at the created order, right? And people are without excuse for believing in a God just from his demonstration of, ta-da, here's the world. And yet, I'll tell you, it's not beyond men to come up with some excuses not to believe it. We get a little bit too big for our britches sometimes. We outgrow our brains, and one of the first things to fall out is the belief in God. And yet, we are not that people. We come to the top of this hill this morning to proclaim this world is here because we serve a God, and this is the God we're serving today, the one who created this. And then Paul says in Acts chapter 17, the reason he did this, notice at the end of that. If he talks about God created everything from one person, everything that's the time that you're living in, the time that you have, so that we will seek him. God threw out his fingerprints. If there's a fingerprint, there's a hand. If there's a hand, there's a person. God says, I want you to keep seeking. You, you see the fingerprint, now I want you to trace back the fingerprint, and I want you to come find me. I'm not far from any one of you, but I'm just a little bit out. I'm giving you a movie trailer, now go watch the movie. Just come see me. Come see me. Now, that's the second argument in Psalm 19. After you look at the world and think there is a creator, the second thing you do is look at the word. This is the special revelation. You've got the general one that everybody sees and everybody's responsible for, and then it drives you to the special one that tells you something about God. And the psalmist is praising God for this. We serve a God who has spoken. He's not sitting up there quietly just wondering how we'll guess his presence. He wants a relationship. And the, he's the one who started this relationship. He spoke first. And so God initiates a relationship by speaking to us. Do you know what idolatry is? It is, the, it is divine ventriloquism. That's what it is. So here's what people do. There is a God out there. We don't know what it is, so we're going to build him. We'll build this totem pole, right, or this idol that we're going to call Baal or Molech or something. And that, that's who they start worshiping. But this, this God is dumb. He doesn't speak. They have no idea what this God that's represented by this idol, what, what kind of doctrine does he give? What, how does he want me to live? I have no idea. And so I start doing ventriloquism. I make that God say what I want him to say. Now, you may remember those of you who were at the, the sweetheart's banquet that we had, right, for all of us married people and Paul decides he's going to get a ventriloquist, a guy who puts his hand up in this dummy and starts speaking. That was quite fun and interesting. That's, that's what idolatry is. It's mankind wanting to recreate himself, give him some divine authority. And so he puts his hand up in the wooden thing and he starts speaking using his own mouth. I'm going to get him to say whatever I want to say. That's idolatry. We don't do that because we have a God who has spoken. He's revealed himself. And he said, I want a relationship with you, but I, I want you to know who I am. I don't want it to be guessing. I don't want it to be trial and error. I don't want you to try to figure out what I want. I'm going to tell you what I want so that the relationship can be accurate and it can be true. And that means if we follow this, if we follow this word, there's going to be clear understanding. That word had to have come from God if we follow it. And that's what the psalmist is saying. And so Psalm 19, here's what the word of God is, all right? It is, it is from God, and he uses a bunch of synonyms to describe what this word is. And I want you just to look at them. The law of the Lord. God is saying, this is how things work. Laws. These are laws. I'm putting them into effect, but I'm not just putting them into effect. I'm putting them into print for you. I want you to know what the law is so you can have a relationship with me. Follow them or not, follow them or not, these are God's laws that he wants us to honor. This is the testimony of the Lord. God is bearing witness to what he's like. Do you want to know what God's like? The only way you can know is if he tells you. You can't guess from your own fallen self. It's his testimony. You know the difference between a biography and an autobiography. Anybody remember what the difference is? A biography, I write a book about Alfreda. By the way, Alfreda, I learned a lot about you this week and going with Ted Knight. He has a lot of dirt on you. 
could write a story about her and kind of study her and kind of figure out and then write it down. And maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong. But you know what an autobiography is? When Alfreda writes her own biography, she knows herself. You know what scripture is? It's not God's biography. It's God's autobiography. He is telling us. He's testifying. This is what I'm like. He's the only one who can reveal it, and he's telling us this. It's his testimony. Third, it's the precepts of the Lord. They are his principles. This is what, how I, this is, this is uh, the, the way things work. These are the principles I put into place in the universe. And not only did I put them into place, I published them so you will know them. It's really great to discover principles. It's another great, uh, it's, it's altogether greater that God told us what they were. And that's what his word is. They're, it's the commandment of the Lord, the structure that he wants us to, to honor, the commandment. It's what he desires to see honored. Not suggestions, not advice. This is what he wants us to know. It's the fear of the Lord. This is a little weird. You would think that you follow it, and that's when you learn to fear the Lord, but he calls the words themselves the fear of the Lord. I think what he means is this. This is how I want to be respected. I'm going to tell you how to handle holy things. I I want you to know that if you want to revere and respect me, you need to let me teach you how to do that. Don't you go guessing. Don't you go estimating. Don't you go kind of using yourself as a standard. Because I, I need to tell you, you know how I learned how to respect Melissa? Not women in general. You know how I learned to respect Melissa? I listened to her. I listen to her and go, oh, okay, so that, maybe other people don't mind that. She don't like that. She's revealing to me what is respect in her eyes. And if I'm a smart husband, I'm going to pay attention. Sometimes I just had to learn it by, oh, I'm listening. Sometimes it sounded like this. Okay, what I just did there, I need not do that anymore, right? She's telling me where the lines are, where the respect is. You know what God's doing in Scripture? He's telling us how we can relate to him and respect him. You know why we worship the way we do? This is not how I would have done it. Seriously, I would have had a band up here. That's kind of fun. I do some interesting things, and every week try to do a little something new to just kind of liven it up a little bit. Nah, get out of your seats, y'all. Quit sitting in the pews like that. That just looks, that's how I do it. And in fact, a lot of worship you see that's like that, That's the standard they use to decide that. That's how I'd do it. God reveals what he wants. Don't go custom making your own idea of what God wants. What God says is, I want, this is what it means to fear me. This is what it means to respect me. What he loves more than anything else is when you do his word. Don't go off roading go guessing and doing these random things that you think might be cool to God. Just take him at his word. That's what he loves. That's what he loves. And the last one is, he says, this is the rules. Your version may say decrees. It may say this is the judgments of the Lord that he's chosen to make known. This is how he's dealt with humanity in the past, and this is what he says he doesn't like and he does. You know how the Supreme Court, when they make a rule on some kind of thing that's been presented to them. They give their opinion. They say, here's why we've decided. You know what scripture is? God's dealing with humanity, and God says, this is the judgment I'm making on this. You know the Sodom and Gomorrah thing? Don't do that. You know the Sodom and Gomorrah thing? Don't, don't, don't do that. Don't like that. These other things in scripture that you'll see, you know that? Don't, don't do that. These are judgment, and we are supposed to learn from them. We're supposed to read this. He's provided it in his library to say, listen, this is the more you know about my judgments, the more you know about me, and I want you to honor me. The scripture is all of this. It's like if I could sit right next to God and say, what do you think about this? And he tells me, I'm responsible then for honoring what he tells me. That's what scripture is. And after saying all this, over, over he just, he's just, and again, remember, this is not like a propositional scripture this is a praise scripture this should be set to music 
He's just describing this is the wonderful thing that we've been given. It all comes from God. And if you think it comes from God, you should pay attention. You'll notice he describes the character of that word, too. With all these words that come out verse after verse after verse, it's perfect. It's sure. You will never step on it and it falter. You will never stand on it and be ashamed. You will never have it fade out and a new thing replace it 10 years from now with the rest of the fads of humanity. It's always right. You might have to debate sometimes certain things that the Bible isn't clear on, but the things it makes clear, it will always be right. It's right today. It was right a thousand years ago. And I'm swearing to you, and we are testifying to you, a thousand years from now, it's still going to be right. It's pure, uncontaminated, clean. It's true. It lasts forever. It's always right. It's not always popular or easy, but it's always right. Right, and there's things when you try to decide what you're going to do, and you have to wait. Chandler's the world's worst, if it's not me, at just kind of weighing everything. What do you do, and how do you decide? What do you consider a sign, and what do you not? Blah, blah, blah. But let me tell you, when the Word says something, that settles it. Man, the sureness of that. I love knowing I'll never have to be embarrassed by a stand I take if it's on the word, ever. No matter what the polls say. And sometimes I don't even have to wrestle with stuff. And that's wonderful. So somebody comes to you, somebody comes to you and says to you, can you imagine what this person did to me? And they tell you this intricate story of the thing this person did to them. And it's often, you're like, oh, that's terrible. I'm sorry that happened. And they say to you, and they're Christians. They're your fellow brother and sister. And they say to you, Do I really, does God really expect me to forgive them? You don't have to go into a committee meeting. You don't have to ask the elders, deacons, preachers. Yes. Yes, 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 always yes. Isn't that refreshing? And somebody comes to you struggling in shame for things they did years ago. It still weighs on them. Yeah, it was years ago. I don't do that anymore, but I'm so ashamed. Could God possibly forgive me for this? You don't even have to fast and pray. You don't need a prayer. It's absolutely clear. Yes, God can forgive you of that. Isn't that refreshing? Isn't that clear? I just, I mean, that's, that's one of those things. There's plenty of things in life that are confusing even when you take the word to them. I'm going to admit that to you. Interpreting that is not always easy. But those things that are clear, let them stay clear. Let them be easy for you. Don't make things complicated that are simple. And this world right now is debating a bunch of stuff. The y'all is really rather simple. Let's let it stay simple. And know that you'll stand on it and it will never give way. But the biggest praise, the most praise, and the most emotional outburst that the psalmist gives is what following the word will do for you. If you actually follow the recipe, what will come out? What will I experience in life? And he says in verse 7, it revives the soul. It sets the soul back where it needs to go. That you are a spiritual being created by God to go through a physical phase before you enter the eternal spiritual existence of your life. That you would be a a majority, well, you can't even say the word majority when it comes to eternal. You are more spiritual than physical, but we give so much time and attention to the physical. And in this world, it's hard to find anything that will revive your soul. You know, you go to your, you might be driving a Ford. I don't know why you do that, but maybe some of you do. Chevy, whatever, whatever vehicle you drive, one of the things you can do is you go to the actual dealer and they can hook this computer up and it reads everything and it knows how that vehicle, because they made the vehicle, so you, you know how that vehicle is supposed to run. You know what the Bible is? It's hooking back up to your creator, to how your soul is to operate, and you hook back in with him and he fixes the messes that the world has wreaked on your soul. Every time you come back together, it just resets it. It revives that soul. You've grown cynical. You've grown hateful. 
You might have grown mean. You're not forgiving and you're being irritable. You need a time to go before God and connect with his word and remember that is not what you were created for. And he, he brings, and it might be because of rebuke, that text may be rebuking you and correcting you and you're letting it because what you believe is that's not just any other literature. Those are words from the creator God who created me and he knows better than I do how this body's to operate. And as I tune back into that word, but now listen, a lot of you haven't hooked into the word in a long time. And there's a lot of disalignment that happens when you don't hook into the Word for a long time. And you hook back into that and you read that and you go, like, man, I, don't, I forgot it said that. Or maybe you've read something you've read a thousand times and suddenly it means something it never meant because you didn't realize from the perspective of where you are right now. It's doing some alignment to you. It's reviving your soul. But it can't do that if you don't access that. But the psalmist, David, knows that's true. He's thinking of all the times that it put him back right. When he was able to say of Saul, I'm not going to strike the Lord's anointed, how in the world did his soul have what it takes to do that, given what Saul had done to him? He kept being revived. Second thing, it makes the simple wise. The simple is people who can't know. The Word enables you to know God's thoughts, and we're told in Isaiah God's thoughts are miles above ours. You know this, right? Do you realize, how many would admit you're, compared to God, you're dumb as a stump? The rest of you don't know it yet, but you'll find out. And God says, my thoughts and my ways are so vastly higher than yours. There's a way that seems right to a man. That man would swear it's right. That guy would say, this is, this is the wisest course of action and ends in death. That, that's just the way we think God's. Okay, so you're, uh, I understand that. But here's what Isaiah is trying to get you to say is, you can think with the mind of God. You can change your way of thinking with God's because we have the mind of Christ, Paul says in Corinthians. We have access to the Word and the Holy Spirit, and together they give us the ability to access. But listen, you've got to be willing to exchange, to adopt a new way of thinking that God says this is the way I think, and instead of debating him and arguing with him and giving him all sorts of reasons why that doesn't make any sense, you have to simply adopt it and submit to it. And when you do that, y'all, it makes you much wiser than you could be on your own. God wants to give you godly wisdom. And he gives you the chance to through his word. It gives your heart joy, he says in verse 8. The way I hear Christians talk about it, I really struggle to find time to read that word. I, I, I just tried, I stole a few minutes and I got some of this. It's like a burden and a check mark. I got, and, and, but the way the psalmist describes it, it gives my heart joy. And we sing some songs like this about prayer, too. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour. Hour of prayer? I see our young people. Okay, get off your phones. I see our young people saying, hour of prayer? Are you kidding? And then we're singing, sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour? I can't wait until Jesus meets me in my hour of prayer. I, that's got to be an old song we get rid of. Let's get rid of it. It makes no sense to us. Let's get rid of it. It does not make sense if you don't see from God's point of view and experience the joy that should come to the heart when lining up with the Word of God. This world will tell you your value is to be found and how well you do something, how good you look, how successful you are at this, how much money you make, and you will never measure up. Then you look at the Word, and it says you are created by God. 
He knows everything about you. He loves you. He was willing to send his son to die for you. He wants to spend eternity with you. He set up an appointment and he's given you the curriculum to use to do that. And he's telling you who you really are, not what the world says. That should bring your heart joy. You will never satisfy the world, but you'll always satisfy your creator when you love his word. That should give your heart some joy, but only if you access it. It enlightens your eyes. It enables you to see truths that are invisible to the human eye. This last week, I hope you did this, Otherwise, you got shades on right now. When you looked up at that eclipse, you had those glasses that were pitch black. If you put them on before you looked up there, you could see nothing. You thought, this, this is just a black wall. And then you look up and you can see it. It allowed you to see what your human eye could not see. And Scripture is exactly the same. If you want to live this world on the world's terms, living by what it says is true and what they say is the most important thing, take the glasses off and just live by the world. The world operates according to what it sees. But Scripture, God's Word, gives the ability to see truths that are eternal, everlasting, the most important ones that you can't see with the human eye. Put the glasses on. Put the glasses on. It all looks different. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, this thing. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away, inwardly we're being renewed day by day. Can anybody testify to this? How many of you feel you're wasting away right now? Okay, some of you do. The rest of you, give it a week. Your, your body's just like, man, this life is terrible, I'm losing all. But on the inner person, the inner person has got that same enthusiasm and joy because it's growing in the Lord every day. For this, mom, this momentary affliction, whatever Paul is having to endure at the time of writing 2 Corinthians, it's, it's preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. We look not to things that are seen. We don't live by what we see with our human eyes, but by what's unseen. Things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Those, but you can't see them without the Word, so put the glasses on. You will swear... The Christian sexual ethic is absurd. The world will tell you that. They'll tell you it's impossible to live. You will die if you don't meet your desires. It's a lie. But you need special glasses to see it. The world will tell you what success is. It'll tell you this is what it is, right? This is what that looks like it's gonna make me successful. I'm gonna pursue that. I'm gonna buy this. I'm gonna be in that crowd. That's what the world's put the glasses on. Because that's not the truth. This past week, Ted Knight and I, I, I admire him. He took me to Bay for a tour. Yeah, three minutes later, we were back at McDonald's. Uh, Bay, Bay went by the house where his lady lived when he picked her up to, to marry her. It's beautiful. Jeremy is a preacher, an old preacher that's in the area for a meeting. So as, as, as he was going back there, I was in tune with this guy, and we went to different things. Went to his high school. He said, the glee club met over there. I had no idea what a glee club was. I said, and he, he said, a glee club was there, and I'd come out, and my lady was coming out of school, and she was going into glee club. And I said, time out, what is glee club? It's music class, he said. Well, I don't know. You're old. Anyway, so... As they would come out and they'd meet, they, he said, that's where I'd get me some sugar during the day. He, I'm telling you, he's old. Nobody talks that way. But I knew what he meant. Give me some sugar right here, right? He said, if we ever got caught, I'd have really been thrown out. But we never got caught. Took me to the church building. Took me to Herman Junction. How many in here has ever been to Herman Junction? Anybody ever been? To, anybody even know where it is? Nobody knows where it is. Few of you do. Yeah, Lambert, I knew you would. He said you would. That's where he kissed his lady for the first time on a youth devotional. I said, we try not to do that, Ted. We have rules against that. They were playing spin the bottle at a youth devotional. You think I'm making this up? It's true. I'm just like, what, what kind of group was that Bay Church? Lamerson, what were y'all doing out there? It's amazing, wonderful stuff, though. And all the stuff coming back to his head. And he made me see it. He made me see this stuff that doesn't even exist anymore. It's an amazing thing. But then I look at his Facebook the next day. 
And he's almost lamenting it. He says, I, I took a tour in the past the last couple days. It was so real to me and so enjoyable to me. I got to thinking my best is in the past. My lady's gone. The best is in the past. But I reminded myself, he said, that always for the Christian, the best is up ahead. Y'all, how does he know that? Listen, we can get depressed in this world. You look around at this world, it's gone nuts. We could get depressed. Put the glasses on. Put the glasses on and let it show you things that you can't see without it. And y'all, the best is yet to come for Ted Knight. I promise, and it is for us too. And for Don and Lois who are 90 years old. It's the truth. Scripture, the word is a warning, he says. It warns us. You may not even realize you're in dangerous territory. You may not realize the risks at any given moment, but God tells you where the risks are. He wants you to know where the stop signs are to prevent crashes in your life. That's what the word is. And sometimes it is easy for us to think, you know what, I violated so many scriptures and I've gotten away with it and no harm, no foul. It doesn't se seems like all these warnings are way overkill and it, I don't see any effects. Well, not yet. They don't show up immediately. But trust God when he says these are the danger areas. He's trying to keep us from driving off a chasm. He's seen more about life and knows more about life than you ever will. And so he says to us, I'm going to use this for this one and the next one. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what help for building others up according to their needs that may benefit those who listen. You may violate one time because you're with some friends and they're talking about people and you just can't resist and so you let it go and you think, oh, oh, I shouldn't have said that, but you know what, I was in a crowd and it won't be anything and for a couple days nothing happens, but then it gets around what you said and it comes around to the other person and it stirs up drama and hurt and you're losing sleep and you're just like, how did I let myself say that? And God's going, told you so, told you so. And the reason I tell you that I so say you won't hurt like that. Next one is, there's, in keeping them, there's great reward. Here's the reward. I wish every time that you did the right thing, you heard applause. And I wish every time you did what God tells you to do rather than what you want to do or others want you to do, you feel a pat on the shoulder, but you won't. And sometimes you might even suffer for it. But you know, and then there are some times when you are feeling the reward. So somebody in your family starts talking about other people and, and, and the family, and it gets around to your family, and it's everybody's in an uproar, and everybody's disturbed, and everybody's, the drama has just been unleashed, but nothing comes back to you because you kept your mouth shut. You did Ephesians 4.29. Here's your reward. You won't hear this, and you won't get a pat on the back, but you're going to go to bed and lay your head on the pillow, and you're going to go straight to sleep. And you're going to sleep all night. That's God's reward for doing the right thing. Same thing for the person who, I've got to buy all this stuff, and I get a credit card. Now, I can buy all this stuff real quick because the world tells me I've got to have it in order to be up there with a junk. And then at the end of the month, you're just over. And then all of a sudden, debt overtakes your life. And let me tell you, it's the number one killer of marriages. We don't know what to do about this debt. And if you just, uh, listen, sometimes when you start hearing, oh, you've got to have this, you've got to have this, put the glasses on and restrain yourself from swiping that card. And when the end of the month comes and you can pay off that credit card and you have a little extra, and you're not strapped, and you're not fussing with your mate, listen real carefully. Because you did what God told you to. That's when you know. You experience these things, you're going to know. This isn't just a great piece of literature, great ethical guidance from a good teacher. These are things no one else could have known that God wanted you to be able to know without having to experience. Just trust him. He wants you to have this. He is wanting you to have a relationship with him and experience this wonderful thing. And I think the greatest thing, I mean, God works in other ways too. He blesses you in other ways in the Holy Spirit. But I'm going to tell you the primary way God wants you to experience these things is simply through obedience. 
I just want you to know that if you'll do what my word says, this will happen. We believe God made the world. We stand here this morning on this hill to say, God believe the, the one who created this world that we live in, he's the one we're giving praise because he deserves it. He did good, didn't he? That's right. And he's also the one who's told us his word. And he's witnessed to us of his will for our lives. And I want to end this lesson on the word of God with a word from God that is the most, I think this wonderful, I just want you to, I take this in and soak this in because this is really amazing stuff to me. Deuteronomy. See, I've taught you statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do them. I've written this to you so you'll do them. I want you to do it. Some people say, did God really expect us to do the Sermon on the Mount? Well, duh. In the land that you're entering to take possession of it. I'm asking you to do this when you get into the promised land. I want you to live this way. All the time doing what I tell you. Now keep, keep following me. Keep them and do them. That will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the people. This is what's going to set you apart. This is what's going to make the people around you marvel. The, the, the Israelites were never told to go take the gospel to a lost world. What they were told to do is draw them to you by your way of life. You do what I tell you to, if you will just live by this wisdom, the world will marvel and go, how could you have known this? There's only one way because we're not lucky enough to do this on our own. And who, when they hear all these statutes... The other nations, when they hear how you live, wow, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it, so close to it, so in relationship with his own people as the Lord our God is to us? Let me answer that for you. There isn't one. There's not a religion in the world that has a God who loves them like we have. Nothing like it. And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous is all that this law I've set before you that there's no one. You know what God wants to do? I told you last week that the eclipse is God showing off, and it is, it's God showing off. His scripture is God showing off too. Here's what he says. I want to show off to the world, but I want to use you to do it. Get this? I want to show off the world my wisdom and my understanding and my insight. I want to show them that I'm a living God. Right? I want to show them, but I want to use you. So here's what I'm, I'm going to give you my words, which is like a wardrobe. I'm going to give you my wardrobe, and I want you to wear it in the world. And when you wear this, the world's going to go, where did that come from? So he's doing this. He's Listen, here's your job for the week. God wants to show off, and he wants you to be his model right so here's what you do let's not debate whether we like what god says or not let's not debate you know the clear teachings of scripture let's just do them let's just be people who do them and let god use that to show the world how wise he is that's an amazing truth that we get to do and he didn't make us do trial and error for this when the other nations around israel were offering up their sons in the fire were having immoral, godless ways of worshiping their God because they were just projecting themselves on it. God says, let me tell you, I want to tell you who I am. I value human life, and I want the quality of your life to be what convinces the world of the quality of your God. So let's live lives by the word and show the world what an awesome God we serve. We believe in him because he created this world. We believe in him because he's given us his word. And this morning, if you've never responded, let me just share with you just one verse of the world, of the word. When, when Peter was asked, what must we do to be saved? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive gift of the Holy Spirit. And this is for everybody. This is for everybody. And this morning, that's the word he would give you if you've yet to decide how you should live. And this morning, you have an opportunity as we stand, as we sing, to encourage you.
seja. I do have an announcement before we get to the shepherd's prayer this morning. Scripture tells us in Proverbs 22, 6, to train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. This church is to be commended for the financial resources that they have given to our youth and to our youth programs. Probably the most, one of the largest things that we do with our youth is the program of Lads to Leaders. And just a couple of weeks ago, we were able to go to Little Rock and participate in the convention at Lads to Leaders. But the convention is not everything that goes with Lads to Leaders. We have two deacons and an elder of this congregation that part of their primary work is Lads. And Ryan Altum, stand up Ryan. Ryan Altum and Kenny Curtis. Kenny, where are you? Where's Kenny? Kenny's, there he is, he's in the back door. He's hiding, he don't like stand up. Ryan and Kenny are deacons. You want to say that, Ryan? There are deacons that are tasked with the Lads to Leaders program. And Jeff Madden, one of our elders, this is a primary work that Jeff is over, and he is deeply involved in this program as well. And we have countless adults that participate and help with this program. This is not something that is done by just these two men and their families. Currently, we have over 70 of our youth that have participated in LADS. And this is from toddlers through seniors in high school is who this is. And so we have participated in an enormous number of events, song leading, when these kids come on Wednesday night and you see them start and they do the song leading the scripture for our Wednesday night service, that's part of lads training them. When we begin our Sunday morning service with one of our young men leading a song, that is part of lads. They work in speech where they're learning to publicly speak and to proclaim the scriptures. They read scripture. You say, well, that's easy. Try it. Stand before a group of people and read God's word and read it effectively. They participate in debate, Bible bowl, podcast, photography, art, memorizing the books of the Bible, memorizing scriptures, puppets. All of these things that our kids are involved in through this LADS program and all of these things teach them and give them the skills that they need to speak to others, to take it with them in their daily lives, to go out and to explain to people what it is to be a Christian. They're also learning how to use their skills in the church, and that is something that we have a tremendous need for. Many times, I think that we talk so much about going to convention that it becomes the mindset that that's really all that lads to leaders is, is a convention that's held once a year and it's held in a hotel in Little Rock and there's this competition and you have trophies and you have medals and you get certificates. And that's all true. It is something that partakes, that is part of the lads program, but it's not the whole lads program. And so this year we took roughly 140 people to convention in Little Rock. But I don't want you to think that that weekend was all that our kids have done because it's a year round, it's a, rear, a year round building of these young people of their skills in serving God. If you're a if you're one of the youth that participated in LADS, would you stand up wherever you're at?
Come on, don't be bashful. Stand up. Somebody's bashful because there's about 70 of you. That's all right. If you brought your ribbons, your banners, whatever you've got out in the lobby, if you want to go back there at this time, you can go ahead and go back there. In the lobby, there are three tables. We started with two. It wasn't enough. We wound up with three. There are three tables back there that are covered with ribbons and medals and a scrapbook that's been put together. And it's all been done by these kids. I know that my boys participated in LADS, my two sons. And somewhere at home, deep in a closet, I got a box of a bunch of trophies and plaques and stuff that they won at LADS. My boys don't care a whole lot about their LADS trophies today. They're grown men. But they're left with the skill set that they learned and they honed through LADS. And that is the purpose of LADS. If you're a parent today and maybe you've stayed away from LADS for whatever reason, maybe it's something that your kids don't feel like they want to participate in or they don't need to participate in, all I want to say is Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. You have a responsibility to train your child. LADS is a good tool for you to use, and we would encourage you to do that. The director of the Little Rock Convention, Doug Burleson, will be speaking at CRC tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. If that's someone that you want to go hear, he is a Freed Hardeman, I believe he's a Bible teacher. Chandler, did he teach you everything you know? Yeah. So we've got Chandler here. He taught Chandler over there, but that'll be tomorrow night. And so if you would like to attend, um, see Ryan. He said if there was enough, he might take a bus up there tomorrow night. We're proud of our youth. We're proud of all that they do. And I'm extremely proud of this congregation for providing the finances that we're able to do all of the things that we do with our youth. This morning, there's several that we need to keep on our prayer list. Betty Smith's son-in-law, Lynn Luster, passed away unexpectedly. He had a visitation for him was last Friday. We need to remember Miss Betty. John Henry is still in St. Bernard's Hospital. I talked to John Jr. this morning. He said that he would be moving to the nursing home on Tuesday. And uh, Miss June could certainly use our prayers. She's got a lot on her right now trying to take care of John. Miss Ida Brown's daughter, Tracy Foster, had a heart attack this week. Marcus Whitley, the husband of Terry Whitley, had a heart attack last Thursday. He is in St. Bernard's and they're going to have a bypass surgery sometime this week. Emma Josephine Haddock is on medicine to control seizures. This is the infant child of Daniel and Meg. Abigail Gage is still suffering from seizures and they too request our prayers. There are many that we have the opportunity to pray for that we haven't mentioned from here this morning, but they are listed in your bulletin. I would encourage you to pick up a bulletin, read through that, and pray for those individuals that are asking for your prayers. It's good to see everybody this morning. We do have a lot of visitors. I apologize for the lengthy announcements here, but uh, it's what we do, and it's something that's very important to us is our youth and the programs that they're involved in. But it is good to have you. If you will, let's stand at this time, and we'll have our prayer. Father, we come before you. Father, we are so overwhelmed with the beauty of this day and the joy that we find in coming together as your, as your children and worshiping you. God, it's our desire that this worship has been acceptable and pleasing in your sight. And we pray, Father, that we will take the things that we have been challenged with here today and that we've been encouraged with and that we can go forth and be a better people and that we can be that model to the world that you have called us to be and that they can see you in us. Father, we know that there are many who are hurting. 
There's many who are facing illnesses that have uncertain outcomes. And we know that they're worried and they're scared. And Father, we just pray that you would be with not only those who we have mentioned here, but those, Father, who struggle and suffer quietly. We pray that you would be with them and that you would comfort them. Father, I pray for those caretakers, those husbands and wives taking care of one another, and for the children who are taking care of their parents, sometimes feeling overwhelmed and not knowing what to do, Father. Father, we're mindful of the ones who have uncertainty in their lives, and they don't they don't know which way to go or which way to turn. We pray, Father, that they can find peace and they can find direction through you. Father, we pray for the marriages, those from the newly married to those that's been married a lifetime, Father. We pray that you would strengthen the, the bonds of those marriages, strengthen those individuals. We pray that they would love one another they would be kind to one another and that they would be forgiving of one another. Father, we know that you love us. We know that you have blessed us in so many ways. And Father, we thank you for these blessings. We thank you for the love and the mercy and the grace that you give to each one of us every single day. And Father, we thank you most of all for Jesus, his willingness to die upon the cross so that our sins can be washed away. Father, we thank you for this love and for the gift of your Son. It's through his name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.